What's up guys, this is Couters and this is a video on a Monday afternoon at 50NL. Um, Zoom, we're going to do a bit of sit in, sit out today, I think. So we're going to play some hands, sit out of the pool to discuss the hand histories and then jump back in. We've got three tables going on, so that should mean that we're always equipped enough with action that we don't have to touch the replay until we actually sit out. Because I want to do a bit more detailed review um, than I would normally do. This is a weird spot on table one where right off the bat, like hijack against or under the gun against hijack, we get raised. I'm just going to fold here. Like it's a massive raise. The reg population is typically pretty nitty and we're at kind of the very bottom of our C bet range there because we are checking a bunch out of position. So it shouldn't be too difficult actually to defend our continuation bet range against that raise. So I'm not overly worried about folding there with king queen. It is like probably the worst hand at LC bet in the first place. So whatever. Ace-9, um, probably a flat on the button, Ace-9 suited. We don't have, we have one weaker player in the big blind here, and I think like getting squeezed in a three-way pot there by the small blind is a lot less likely than it would be in just like a heads-up pot, and also like the implied odds can be better as well, so I think calling's fine. Probably just going to call one here with Ace-9, just because like a random 22-11 over 9 hands is just not really going to be barreling the turn super wide especially for that size so i think it's a pretty standard fold in that situation i've already got some interesting hands actually that i want to look through sorry i should have led the turn there on table three that was like really bad for some reason i thought that he'd bet flop um as it is i can incredibly rep a bunch of jack x so i'm just going to turn 10 high into a bluff it blocks like jack 10 and jack 8 which i guess are like some credible jacks that he could have and play that way so because it's something like queen jack or i guess jack 10 is quite likely to bet the flop as well um, so maybe the 10 is not like actually all that useful, but whatever. <clears throat> and Velen obviously tanks with the 9, which is really quite absurd, because like with the 9 you should just be like snap calling. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say that there was action going on on other tables, but as you guys know from my videos, like this pool is just far too nitty, there's huge nits. Um, Ace-King, we need to be kind of careful here with our triple range, like we can't let it get too out of control, but like my 10 nines have just got there, um, and I have... When I open hijack here, I don't really have a better hand to triple barrel bluff with than ace king because of its blockers, obviously blocking king queen and ace queen. It's pretty much what you want to do as those are the most likely hands that are going to call you down for three streets. So I feel like it's fine to just go ahead and triple that combo, but we just need to make sure that we're not tripling too much other stuff on the river. Lest our range is going to get a little bit out of control. I can't believe I managed to finally throw the word lest um, into a video after like millions of years of not being able to use it. Not that it's been like on the forefront of my mind to do that, but still pretty proud of myself. I gave the dogs a couple of ridiculously tasty looking bones with like filling in the middle, so hopefully I'll get peace for this, for the duration of this video. It's never a guarantee in this household, but we do what we can. King Queen here, I'm just check folding against a kind of unknown but fishy looking player. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm out of position, like I could see bet there against a random fish, but just being out of position really takes away a lot of the EV there. If he checks back, our turn bet becomes a lot more profitable because to check behind, like, the fish is generally going to have a fairly weak range. Um, so delayed sea betting there is probably a bit better than sea betting, so I'm quite happy to check fold the flop and go for the delayed sea bet instead. This is one of these spots in table two where it's not really correct to either min open or to, or to 3x. I think it's a spot where you want to get a bit more money in here against Goo coin. But you need to remember that this guy here is going to be 3-betting you when Gucoin does fold and squeezing you when he does call, like a bunch of the time. 7-5 off, I'm just going to flat to that sizing because it's, it's just ridiculously um, tiny and he doesn't really deserve any fold equity by making it that size. So I'm going to go ahead and stab. Not too big, not too small here. Getting check raised, I mean this is probably like a strong hand most of the time, the min check raise. The actual drawing to this gut shot is not that favourable. I mean it's a two-tone board for a start. And secondly, it's a paired board, so the gut shot, the implied odds of it are just going way down for sure. So we won't bother with that. Four rates marginal, like I could open that there against what seems to be a passive fish, but we'll just wait and see if, you know, we've got a bigger um, HUD sample in the future that just shows that he is genuinely passive and is not going to, like, three bet or be a station or whatever, because the hand is very garbagey to play out of position, if that is the case. Queen 6 being complete here, we seem to have, like, a weaker player in the big blind, so... All the more reason to get into the pot with the city queen, getting like a phenomenal pot odds and should get raised a lot less frequently with a fish in the blind than we do against a reg. Fish just love, they just love to check in that kind of situation. This guy's 3-bet is only 5%, which kind of puts me off going for a cold 4-bet bluff. Like I think it's a spot where if he 3-bet a bit more than this and was a nit, 
you'd want to do it with like a really really like bluff heavy polarized four bit range but you know it's just like too much of a chance that his range is like too super tight to yield any fold equity in the first place so i've no doubt that he does fold like the weaker hands in his range the question is like how many of them even exist in the first place so a spot where a lot of people would miss i think it's a very clear three bet iso against under the gun men open when we have the button here and 10 nine suited we flop amazingly and we just want to call the lead here because we have tons of equity we have showdown value there's no reason to to raise or bet the turn or anything like that we can take our pair of tens towards showdown now um if he leads river like we're going to be seeing a bunch of ace x here but we're getting like good pot odds against the fish like we only need to be good 25 percent of the time so is this a lead on jack 10 deuce i'm just going to fold nines against like a tight player leading here so this is a reluctant call like i don't think i'll be good all that often but i'll be good enough king queen interesting i mean that's the thing like it's harder to have a pair of aces than it is to have two random cards so although his frequency for like leading a pair of aces is probably a bit higher and then checking turn betting river is like quite an ace x kind of line it doesn't mean that you have to fold just because he has ace x more often than not does not mean that you have to fold obviously like you need him to have ace x like 75 percent of the time there to actually fold so we're not gonna um what is going on here we're gonna see bet our whole range obviously Against the fish here with Ace Jack, I'm just going to start by checking the flop because the hand is not like super amazing to go for three streets. And he does look like he has raised, he's PFR'd so far, so he may be like on the more active end of the fish spectrum. I mean, we don't really know as of yet, but it's certainly possible that he can like have a considerable bluffing range. So I'm just really happy check calling down here. If he has anything that beats me, it's just kind of really bad luck, to be honest. Um, Queen's not even a bad card because it makes ace-queen a lot less likely. Um, so just kept check calling down there because it's so hard for the fish to really have a good value hand. Um, this is the kind of player that going for a, a bet on the river is actually quite good against. So I think like it's okay here. I mean, we do block queen-jack and jack-10, and I think you know people love to put you on ace-king. The fish love to put you on ace-king, right? So we'll just go ahead and rep that shit. I hate the word rep in poker, like pretending to have something, trying to manipulate your opponent into thinking that you have something when you know nothing about your opponent. Like it's a horrible term that leads to a lot of horrible thought processes, honestly. But in a spot like that, I think people like fish are going to actually put you on exactly an ace because they make the mistake of trying to put you on a hand. Oh, I bet you had an ace and you got there. And this is what some of my weaker students will do is put people on one hand instead of a range. And that first when you're teaching a beginner, like a lot of the struggle is trying to get them out of that so, so costly habit. Why did you call? I put them on a busted flush draw. Why? Don't really know. It's a really big three bet, but we don't really have any choice but to call here. Stacks aren't really good for four betting and calling it off. I'm going to just check here. This board is like just too wet. We're going to call. I mean, it's debatable whether or not you call two or three streets here when you have tens. Like, the arguments for calling only two is that the population are a bunch of net boxes. Arguments for calling three is that this guy is definitely more active and he's running a river bet of two out of two, turn bet of eight out of 12. Yeah, I think I'm going to call down here. I think I'm pretty close to the top of my range. I could also have like nines and eights here that I would fold or eight, seven suited or something. Um, I think I'm probably folding a bit too much of my range um, if I fold there. I'm just going to go ahead and obviously stick in the 3-bet here with the nuts. I mean, this probably is ace-king as well a lot of the time, but it could also just be like some really bad random fish that's deciding to um, raise like a naked king x or flush draw or something on the turn, so that's obviously our hope, but no cigar. Nice and pretty configuration with only clubs and diamonds there, though. But we'll go ahead and pay poker stars the maximum rake because they deserve it. Um, actually, no, they don't. What am I saying? They don't deserve shit. Sorry, just spewing a little bit of um, anti-stars negativity. Keep making me run good, those stars. I appreciate it. I appreciate the run good of this session, despite the fact that I'm berating you to a live audience of Grinder School members. It's definitely very much appreciated. It's very kind going out of your way to give me the run good, despite the fact that I'm abusing you on camera. I mean, say what you want about stars. They still offer a ridiculously slick and enjoyable experience for playing poker. So at the end of the day, that's worth quite a lot, even if they do bump up break and take away their loyalty rewards and all that kind of thing. Um, this spot's kind of close. I kind of hate cold calling here. It's like a pure set mine almost, but with the fish that in the pot as well, I think it just about becomes profitable, but it's certainly like not horrible to just fold there. I mean, this three bears, I'll just pull it onto the screen so you can see he's like 16, 13. His range will be very tight, but the thing is like on boards like this, if he doesn't bet, I think Jax is good like really often and we can like protect the turn successfully on a good turn card, which is a lot of turn cards are quite good for us. 
However, I mean, if he does bet, then we're a lot less happy. Now, this gets tricky here. We do have to bet here because we just have the best hand too often. There's a fish in the pot. I don't think we have to bet too huge, but we have to make a bet that, like, two over cards can't peel for sure. Sly dog calls, I'm not overly thrilled about that. Like, Queens is definitely in his range. Um, there are some draws in there as well. Like, he could have nines, I guess. It's sevens, something like that. It's possible. I think there's little enough air that I can check river, and then the fish being in the pot should deter him from bluffing me off the hand. When this happens, I mean, we just have to fold. It's unclear what hand wants to slow play the flop there. I guess something like aces is pretty treacherous, but there's, like, so many people behind there. Like, someone beats jacks there, like, almost all the time, so we just do have to bet fold, unfortunately. But we have to bet to protect our hand in the first place, because it is good quite a lot, just not when that action occurs. King Jack on the right there was not a million miles away from just going ahead and actually um, three betting, but you are out of position there against the fish, so it's not as good. We're just going to bet one here. Look to get peeled by any random pair just for value. It's fine. There's a spot I want to look at later actually that I maybe should have folded in. It just felt like really gross to fold in. Like you guys know me, I hate like. I hate just like butchering my red line for no good reason when there's a higher EV alternative, but um, it'll be interesting to look at. So we'll probably play for like another five minutes and sit out and jump back in or something like that. Min 3 bet here, just a very easy peel and try to gin. It's not bad, I mean it's not gin, but it's fine for calling a couple of streets with and just seeing what happens. Not the best turn in the world, but oh well. Um, yeah, not thrilled about making these calls to these bet sizes, but like our implied odds are, or sorry, our pot odds are just, no implied odds obviously, our pot odds are just so great um, that I don't really think we've got a great deal of choice. And I mean, the, the EV he makes there is just very minimal compared to what he could make by actually betting a reasonable, like, you know, sensible size that someone with uh, more of a brain would choose, more of a poker brain, I'm sure he's smart in other endeavours. Um, but yeah, like that's just horrible obviously, just betting absolutely tiny with kings and just letting everything draw and letting everything make very minimal mistakes by calling you. Um, depends what the range is obviously, how big a mistake we're making, but it's not really anything we can we can know or do anything about. Um, I'm going to bet a bit bigger here, I don't think it's a range bet. And with nines, I'm going to get this flat because 19-6 in the big blind is very likely not going to be someone who's going to squeeze very often. And nines is like the kind of hand that really likes the flat. Um, this is close. I think check raising are, is probably still the best option here. We can have nines, fives. Okay, not that many value hands at all, but it's a board that's dry enough that it will get it will get c bet sometimes. I think. I don't love barreling these turns, but when I do have like a nut flush draw, I can get called by worse draws and be in like really good shape and stuff. I think it's fine. Um, and also like there's fold equity from like two random cards. I mean it's debatable. Like maybe I should just not bother barreling the turn. To be honest, it's probably a, there's a reasonable argument for that. Um, so doggy Dave calls. I expect his range to be kind of things like maybe some weak jacks, like some pocket pairs, some flush draws, some nine x. I don't expect much for a bluffing range if I check from this kind of tight looking player. So I'm just gonna bet for value and hope to get called by like queen ten or a jack or something like that. There's not really a whole lot else to do in this situation. If we get raised, it's actually a little bit uncomfortable. Like, I don't expect it to be like, that happy about it, but it should happen very rarely, just by vir virtue of the fact that he has a good hand very rarely. So because there's two high cards here, this is like a check back. Why is it important to check back some hands on boards with two high cards? Because you have a formidable amount of Queen X, and Queen X really just hates betting. Like, it's so ugly to bet with Queen X. So definitely think it's just a, a good spot for a delayed C-bet with Ace X instead of an automatic C-bet because that would leave our, our checking range a bit too weak. It would just be like Queen X and nothing really better in there. So we don't we want to avoid that scenario. I'm going to actually sit out and just talk over some of the hands, I think, in, in Poker Tracker that have been interesting so far. Um, this is just a clear defend with ace jack off and a clear call on the flop with one of the better ace highs that we can have with the gut shot provided for us there as well. I'm going to be like crushing a lot of the Broadway hands at Villain C bets there really badly. No reason to turn this into a bluff. It's just got too much showdown value. We do have 
hands with a lot less showdown value that we're happy checking here. I also think that hands like ace king or ace queen or whatever are quite likely to check call the flop. So I don't really expect them to be in a bet flop check turn range all that often. So betting to make them exactly full by the river is not really worth it. So just checking and showing down there after after you call. And there's nothing to even feel bad about. Like people get so so wound up about like, oh man, I just have to call and I don't know what I'm doing on the turn. It's like just fold the turn if he bets again. Like where are you in your range? Does it really matter? Is it really such a massive deal if you make a fold against someone you know nothing about and then they happen to have a good hand? It's not as long as your range isn't overfolding, that's the thing. Um nines I'll go ahead and check call. Like it depends how passive this guy is. Snap check back probably caps his range extensively, so I think betting for value now is definitely on. I mean, like, the snap check is just more indicative of, like, a weaker hand than a better one. I'd probably check folding this river is okay, because he's not going to have very much air. should be checking back a lot of the worst stuff, which is fine. He's not going to have air there because, by the way, like, the flush draw completes. The king hits some random over cards. There's very little air left in his range that needs to bluff here. I mean, there's stuff like jack 10 or jack 9 or something like that, I suppose, but it's not a great deal. I don't mind check folding nines there. I think it's better than check calling, especially against someone who snap check back to flop, indicating passivity. So I'm going to go ahead and just set out next big line and we can like go into Poker Tracker and talk about some of the hands that we've just played and some of the ones that you guys didn't catch because I was setting up the video at the time of recording them. Um, this is probably close king 10 here, honestly. I think... I mean, I, I'm probably bluffing too much if I bluff this hand. I just don't think that's necessarily too bad of a thing against this population. It's almost good enough to flat with. It's just I don't think it's going to be a great call. So just adding a few more suited combos to my 3-bit bluff range and being a bit bluff heavy is something I'm not not overly bothered about because I just suspect it's honestly going to be plus EV in a vacuum like by quite some distance. So I'm fine with that. Um, King 8 here. Not really much to do against the 4x. It can't be part of a 4-bit range because that 4-bit range would be far too out of control if it were. HUD just seems to have completely stopped at this table for whatever reason. I'm not really sure why. And this is probably range bettable, it's kind of close, it's somewhere around the borderline with two highest cards, but I think we can just bet our range on it. Like, there's just not much villain can do about it, as I say every time I make that play, it's just like a way of continuing with your whole range, not unbalancing yourself, not breaking up your range in ways that suck, like having to check full air and just like saying to villain, look, this is the best way for me to play and there's nothing you can do about it, so that's fine. Okay, let's bring up the old poker tracker and see what interesting spots we had there. So, I'm going to put on a filter here. I'm going to go to view stats, my reports. I'll show you guys what I'm doing. So, new report, hand report, finish. And we're going to go to today. Excuse me. And we're going to have a look at some of the hands that we just played, basically. So, I'm going to double click the MyC1 column to see like the actual. I'm going to make sure that we're actually viewing. All of the hands from that session, not just the last 100. It's a kind of unnecessary filter. Like, who wants to review the last 100 hands? You'd literally be just stopping all the time to review. Um, so, let's take a hand that I'm kind of unsure about. This one, first of all, where it's kind of awkward and dodgy, to be honest. Like, this might strike you as an obvious fold. I can assure you it's not, but it might be a fold. My call might be bad here, but it's not as bad as you think. That's my disclaimer. Because, like, a random fish min raises to three, which kind of gives him, like, big cards. It's not like he, he can just have anything here. He has more bigger cards and more, like, bigger pairs than, like, the average fish um, calling range against an open. So this, like, four bet here, it's not like a squeeze. It's like a cold four bet. And that's the thing we need to remember, I think. And then um, when we get to the flop, I think the four bet sizing is fine, first of all. It gives villain, like, a terrible price to just call and play fit or fold, and it leaves a nice bluffable amount left so I can just check them on every single flop and just call. This is pretty close to like the worst flop because of the queen. Like 8, 7, 5, make no mistake, I just check call off right away because there's all these hands like ace, jack, king, queen, etc. And there is still like ace, jack, ace, 10 in here probably like when I check this board I just crush and for that reason I feel like I probably have to call. It's just likely that he shoves absolutely anything at this point a really high amount of the time. So, I mean, we could we need to get an equity calculator out to work this out exactly. But I need to be good 27% of the time. If he does have a hand like 10s or jacks, like I've got some equity. I've got like 
18, 19% equity or whatever. So I can improve. And if he does have a hand like ace queen or something, yeah, I'm pretty dead to three outs. Um, but at least I block like the hands that dominate me. He's more likely to have like queen jack than ace queen, and I've got like six outs against that. So I don't know. I think it's kind of probably like a, a, you could fold here. Probably it might be slightly better, but I go for a call. I don't think the call is horrendous, and then we get the satisfaction of being like, hey, we're a better player than you because you're a fetch, and we run like god against you and suck out on you when you actually get it and crushing us. So that's the way it goes sometimes. Like the fish have to lose a bunch of the time as well. They have to get lucky. But fish also run terrible. It's not just you that get the runs terrible and the fish suck out on you. Sometimes the fish run really, really bad and you suck out on them and just beat them. It's like overkill. Like you already had the skill edge, then you just like crush them in variance. It's fun. But alas, probably stops them from playing as much in the future, which is a shame. But you want to get lucky against the fish and have the fish get lucky against the other regs. That's the way it should go. Okay, so other situations. This one is also... Well, that's not the one I'm thinking about. What's the other one I'm thinking about? Um, a spot where we bet three times. This one here. Yeah, this is probably, like, possibly a, a range mistake as well. If I go through the hands I don't play so well. Like, when I'm on camera, I tend to play better. I'm more, like, accountable. Like, the hands I think I've made mistakes in are the ones that happened before the video. Which is kind of interesting. Maybe if I ever go back to being a professional poker player, I'll just like always record myself play. Although, oh my god, the energy and the strain on your voice, maybe not. But it's good for students to feel accountable. It's good for them to feel like someone's watching them and they have to like make sense. They have to do things for logical reasons and not just because they feel like it. Um, that's really important. And I definitely think that you can achieve that by just like recording yourself play sometimes, like sharing it with the group, like my study group. We do a lot of video review where a student will play a session and they'll post it on Carrot Corner or Google, or Google Plus group, which you can join, by the way, just email me if you want to, to pay a subscription or if you want to just get in for free, you can hire me as a coach, but I'm getting pretty busy. But anyway, back to the back to the point of this. Um, oh, my email address is admin at Carrot Corner if you do need to get in touch about that. Um, back to this hand, though. Like, I feel like this may be a range mistake. I don't think it's something I've done that's horrible in a vacuum, but when you bluff... You need to you need to recognize that with every combo that you add to your bluffing range, your bluffing range gets out of control, and you also need to, or it moves closer towards being out of control, I should say, and you also should realize that when villain faces your bet on the river, his required equity is always considerably less than fifty percent. So if your bluffs encroach upon like half of your range, you're far too unbalanced. Even if you're like over betting, you're still easily laying villain the correct odds to call you, given how often you have a bluff. So you need to kind of keep that under under wraps by thinking about the rest of your range and selecting the best combos for the job of bluffing. Don't just bluff with any old combo. Try to find the ones that actually make the most sense to bluff with. So here, with king-queen, we bet the flop big because our range is polarised. Like, we don't have that many bluffs that have terrible equity. We don't have any that have terrible equity. We have reasonably high equity bluffs and then we have, like, value hands that are really strong and are interested in building a big pot, and furthermore, those value hands are interested in building a big pot now rather than later, and they want to like just go for it. So betting big here makes a lot of sense. Filling calls. On the turn, like we pick up a flush draw. A lot of our range has improved now. Like We've got flushes, we've got 8x in there, we've got, I don't know, like hands that picked up backdoor draws. So it makes sense to attack this turn pretty aggressively, and I think king-queen here. It's probably okay to bet again on the turn because on the turn, you know, you're kind of making villain indifferent to calling by bluffing more often. Like, you can bluff, like, half the time here because your bluffs have equity to improve. They're not dead in the water like they'll be on the river. Whereas when we get called here and then a river card comes down, and now our bluff is totally dead. Like, now we just cannot win if villain calls us. We know this. Our bluff has 0% equity against villain's range, whereas on the last street it had, like, 20% against his bluff catchers. And by villain's range, I don't mean like his nut flushes. We're not trying to make him indifferent to calling us with a nut flush. We're trying to make him indifferent to calling with somewhere around like the middle of his range. So something like ace 10 or something. And on this river, I guess we're trying to make villain fold a hand like jacks or ace 10 or king 10 or something like that, basically. Which is a fair amount of his range. He's not going to have a set here that often, given how wet the board is. I think like sets and flushes and stuff will raise at some late, at some earlier point in the in the hand. And so villain's range will not be like totally capped, but it'll be like kind of like um, semi-capped range here. So I feel like we do want to bluff this river quite large, but at the same time, we have hands in our range such as 8x 
and like a, a kind of worse flush that don't like want to absolutely hammer it. So I feel like the good sizing here is somewhere around like two thirds pot or something like that. It's fairly big. It's like a polar size, but it's not like out of control. And it means that we are comfortable actually betting that size with most of our value hands. We don't want to be betting a size that actually causes Villain to just like very comfortably fold every single worse hand. So if we have like 8x here, we don't want to be like hammering it, but I do think we still want to bet. So, I mean, you could check back 8x, but I think that's a little bit nitty. So I go for 950, but the question is not like, is this sizing okay or is this bluff okay in a vacuum? Like it's probably not bad in a vacuum. Like you can expect Villain to fold a lot, but the problem with it is that you actually block a lot of Villain's folding range. You block Queen 10, you block King 10, and you don't block any nut flushes. Um, the Queen of Diamonds is a semi-useful blocker, but it also blocks Queen Jack, which is folding. This hand is kind of wrong to triple the river with. Like, I should be looking at hands like Ace of Diamonds X that missed. Um, I should be looking at hands like something with a, I guess with a, hmm, I don't know actually, it's kind of hard to have really useful blockers here, come to think of it. Well, I'm trying to think what other air I actually have on the turn, and there's not a massive amount of it, but something like Queen Jack would be better, I think, because it blocks, like, well, I don't know, maybe Villain shouldn't have jacks or queens in his range anyway here. I don't know, I think my fear is just, like, when I've got all the Ace of Diamonds hands here, and I will have some, although, come to think of it now, I don't actually see bet all that many just naked Ace of Diamonds, because they don't have any kind of straight draws. So come to think of it, perhaps this hand is not as bad as I thought, like, maybe it is kind of up there with hands that I want to bet. I just think, like, Queen Jack is potentially better, but it's not actually clear as to why that would be. I guess, like, blocking Jack-10 and Queen-10 is a bit better than blocking King-10 and Queen-10, because they're more likely to... Well, no, they're less likely to fold, so I guess I'd rather have the King than have a Jack, all things considered. Yeah, maybe this hand is not too bad, but it's, it's difficult, you see what I mean? Like, it's trying to, trying to actually work out on this run out, like, where my bluffs come from and what they should be. A good way to approach this as well is to think about my value range first and be like, okay, so my value range here is probably 8x and better, which, let's face it, there's a fair amount of 8x in my range here. I mean, I've opened button, so there's all kinds of, like, 7-8, such x flop. I actually don't have that. I don't have 9 I don't have 10 eight. All those hands check back in the flop because they're not, like, polarized enough to bet. Okay, so I have, what 8s do I actually have here then? More stuff like Jack-8, Queen-8 suited, King-8, no, Queen-8 off, King-8 off, Ace-8, a lot of eights in my range here. I actually have a lot of value hands come to think of it. I have all my eights, boats, flushes. That's a lot. So I should actually find enough bluffs here. And I think like I do have to bluff this given how many value hands I have. Aha, got to the bottom of this in the end, I think. But I had no idea in game, quite frankly, if this hand should be in my bluffing range or not. And it's just because I hadn't analyzed the spot well enough. I'm not familiar enough with this kind of really wet texture and what hands I should go ahead and bluff. Like King Queen with a diamond is a lot of combos, it's like eight combos, so you do have to kind of be, well, King Queen off with a diamond six combos. You have to be kind of careful, like that it doesn't get too through the roof, but yeah, like I say, I don't have that many, I don't have that much air because the flop is wet and my C bet range is a bit stronger. Like the air I have is not too abundant and I, I, I just hit that turn a lot of the time, like so much of the stuff that bets the flop hits that turn. And that expands my value range and it does help Villain as well, as well but remember that Villain didn't raise so his range is less capped than ours and so we definitely want to want to like bluff a lot of the hands that we have here because we need to in order to actually bluff enough like for this sizing we're offering Villain pot odds of 2.56 to 1 28% so we want to bluff like 28% of the time now, it's not like a lot, but because our value range is pretty abundant here, like we do need to, to bluff combos like this, I think. So I think this is actually fine in hindsight, but at the time I wasn't I wasn't really too sure. But note that I'm not analyzing this based on vacuum factors. I'm not going like, oh, how often will Villain call my bet? Like, what kind of player is he? I don't really know. Like, okay, I've got 1,500 hands. That's quite a sample. And I can see that like he's fairly in line. So if anything, I want to over bluff here which is another, like, this. that was just the balance side of things I was talking about there. We don't even, we've not even touched on the exploitative side of things yet. So he does seem kind of fit or fold. His went to showdown, that was 29%, which is actually kind of high, so I don't really love that. But it's such a small sample, it's hard to really know if it's actually, truly that high or not. It could easily be like 24%, and it's just like 29% over those 1,500 hands. Like, it's difficult to see. But yeah, I think there's nothing wrong with this, actually, in hindsight. I think it's fine. 
Um, what else? Yeah, I mean, I think everything else here is, like, fairly standard. I don't think there's much else to say. If you guys have any questions, you can always leave me a comment in the thread. I'm going to go back now and jump back on for, like, ten minutes for the end of the video. Just for fun. Apologies for the noisy chair. People have said to me, like, your video is a good man, but your chair is, like, so noisy I can't deal with it. And I'm like, yeah, sorry, I should really order a better one. It's not even that comfortable a chair, you know, if it was really comfy then I could forgive its noisiness, but no, it's really just noisy without justification because it's not actually like a baller chair, it's kind of like, I remember the day I got it actually, I carried it home from the shop, dogs are going absolutely berserk because there's probably something at the door, I can't actually do anything about this because I'm upstairs and this software doesn't allow for pausing, I know that's ridiculous, but my good recording software has started like flashing all over the place when I play live for some reason, it's like not compatible with stars, so... Um, if the dogs do shout anymore, there's literally nothing I can do about it, and I'm sorry, you just have to, have to bear it till they shut up. It's like, one of them's bark isn't really that annoying, but that one that you can hear there is a horrible, horrible sounding dog. Like, it literally just makes the most threatening noises that it can, like, the most horrible sounds to try and, like, deter the person at the other side of the door or whatever, or, like, stop the other dog from biting it, but... And does it do your head in, like, listen to that shit. Imagine you had to listen to that all day. Like, it sucks you guys have to hear this right now, but, man, sometimes I have to listen to that for ages. And it's like no one even at the door anymore, either. It's just completely unnecessary barking, like it really is. If it continues, I will just like stop the video and apologize because like obviously you don't want to listen to that at all. It may be stopping and we can like talk about hands for like another another few minutes or something, but maybe not. Maybe I'm just gonna stop the video. Because you guys have hopefully learned enough in the quiet time that we had already. I'll play this hand with Ace 10 and we'll see what the situation is. Again, I can only apologize guys, sorry about that. Okay, so in this situation here, like guy limps, we go for the ISO, like very wet board. We want to bet nice and big here and just get our value really soon. And like the instant checking on the turn, like the calling and instant checking is generally more of a sign of a capped range. So I'm going to go ahead and bet like 750 here, which is fairly large again. And then just like look to maybe check behind on some rivers. The seven's not the best card. It thins our value a little bit because obviously makes seven X move ahead of us, which was some of the villain swap calling range, albeit not that much. Oops. Just randomly bringing up my poker tracker for no reason. And my girlfriend's like ordered me all this stuff for Christmas, and it, but it arrives like when I'm trying to work and it causes the dogs to do this and it's like, man, I really appreciate the Christmas presents, like, that you're ordering me on Amazon, like I'm super excited to open them when Christmas arrives, but right now they're a fucking pain in the ass because they cause excuse my language, they, they cause me to get so disrupted, like, see when you work from home, like, the challenges are actually numerous sometimes, like, you feel like, oh, you work from home, it's such a breeze, like, you roll out of bed and you go to your work or whatever, but sometimes it's like trying to actually get the tranquility to work is more difficult than you would think. This is kind of oversized, it probably doesn't need to be quite this big, but I really don't want this fish to call me and cause the reg to call and then us go, like, multi-way, Ace three of diamonds is just about good enough to peel to an under the gun open, but not by a great deal. I'm definitely not bluffing turn with it, or you're just bluffing far too much. You're just so exploitable there. There's no reason to bet this hand on any street. There really isn't. It just inflates your range far too much. I'm going to check my whole range here. Like, the pot's already massive. I don't really need to bet anything because I just have a lot of showdown value here. I'm going to check twice and bet river. Kind of targeting hands like king queen and king jack and stuff like that. I want these hands to, like, start betting at me. And like the population, my fear is that the population is so nitty in these kind of spots with how much they bluff. I mean, I don't really know who this guy is. I'm pretty damn close to the top of my turn checking range here. Um, but how often do I expect this to be a bluff? That's the question when villain checks back flop. Oh man, he's like, he's repping like exactly like ace 10 or pocket 10s or something like that. I'm really far up my range. I just feel like this population is so nitty. 
Like, this is such a nitty fold for me to make, it really is. It's so, oh, I can't do it, I've got too many worse hands in my range, I just can't. Like, I feel like I'm beat there so often, but man, I just have to be like a slave to balance sometimes, because I mean, my range contains like kings and queens and stuff like that as well. Like, it contains so many more horrible hands in Ace Jack that, God, I, I just feel like they're never bluffing there. Like, I don't know, just from experience. I could be wrong. Not never bluffing, obviously. Why does the HUD not work on this one table? Like, what the hell is that all about? A ridiculous fault to have. Like, is the HUD down here for that one table? Is that what's going on? Or is that a replayer HUD? No, I think that's a replayer HUD. That's kind of bizarre. Um, yeah, but like I'm so so close to the top of my um, turn check call range there that like on the river, I don't know, I don't know. It can't be too bad to to call honestly. It's just like a feeling that the regs under bluff that spot considerably, and so like there might be some mitigating circumstances that allow me to fold, even though it it consists of a strategy of me folding like almost all of my range. I mean, I can play ace queen the same way, but I think I start betting ace king on the turn for sure. So I feel like I just don't have. Just do not have enough um, worse hands there to, to get away with folding, but depends how, how correct my feeling is on how exploitative that spot is. We don't really want to like get 4-bet here and blow this fish out of the pot, we just want to call in position and see a flop with the fish with a suited hand that's going to play pretty well. And not thrilled to call a C-bet from a tight player here, like this multi-way, but we can just call in full turn, it's not going to be a big deal. Like, if he is tight enough to have a tight C-bet range, he shouldn't bluff the turn very much. And if he's loose enough to bluff the turn, then he's loose enough to C-bet wider and give up sometimes. So, either way, I feel like you can you can call here. But it's not very happy. If I hand a bit weaker, I'd turn it into bluff at this juncture, but I think it's just a little too good, as tempting as that is. Nah, that line is just never a bluff, ever. Against this population. Like, no way. Um, ace five, like out of position here. I'm just gonna bet again. I don't love it, but I feel like it's just a bit better than the alternative of check folding or check calling. Um, ace in the river probably gives us enough value to just go ahead and bet. Like ten x is by far the most common thing we're gonna see here. Don't need to bet too big. We just need to bet big enough to extract from ten x. So that's what we'll do. Guy donks on ace queen four. Like really, this guy likes to donk. It seems. Oh no, he didn't dunk. Sorry, he three bet me. I'm just not used to playing fifty and I'm having like this small pot size. Um, yeah, okay. We don't need to defend to that C bet then. Kind of lost my mind for a second there. I was like, how dare you lead at me on that texture? Like, how dare you? But I can forget it. He three bet pre, so I buy his story a bit more now. Again, horrible logic. I buy his story. It's again like putting someone on a hand. Don't do that. I'm just like I'm bantering. It's like figurative. It's not real. I don't mean it. Obvious C bet with queens, I think. Not really much to say about that. And I'm going to go ahead and wrap up, guys, because I have to get ready for my next coaching lesson. So, King 10, I mean, kind of close. Who's ahead? Probably can't flat it from that position. Could 3 bet it, but again, my 3 bet range would get out of control, so I just want to avoid that for the most part. It's okay against the really tame regs, but against the random regs, I'm not totally convinced that it can go quite that way to hijack against um, under the gun. Some of my EV is tainted by the fact that um, I'll get cold called as well, or cold 4-bet, because there are a lot of players that can just wake up with the nuts ahead of me. For 6 max there are, in full ring it's like there's no one ahead of me at all, but in 6 max terms, like 4 people is quite a lot. And that's the end of our session. Hope you enjoyed that, minus the dog barking. I think I played pretty well there, a few little minor things I'm not totally convinced about i.e. that call at the top left, I just strongly suspected his range was like ace 10 and 10s and like nothing else because no one ever bluffs there. Or if they do bluff, they bet flop, not check back flop and bet turn, that's a thing. But whatever, I'm not too bothered about that. If I can make an exploitative fold there and it's right, I think I'm just killing the game so hard. So to not fold there, I don't think is like the end of the world, to be honest. And fold there for the right reasons as well. Don't fold there because, oh my god, I put a villain on ace king. Like, fold there because the population is just unbalanced towards having like ace 10 and 10s there essentially all right guys over and out for now see you on the all in the next video and i hope you enjoyed that one thank you for watching see you next time